Todd Burroughs is going to introduce our speaker. To uh, introduce Dr. Lansing to uh, Iowa State University. Uh, he asked me to keep it brief, so that's what I'll try to do. Um, the thumbnail sketch is he was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so he's basically a Midwestern person like many of us here. In 1972, he received his BA from, in uh, general studies at Wesleyan University. And in 1973, that's pretty quick, one year, he got his MA in uh, Anthropology at University of Michigan, and then uh, again received his PhD at uh, University of Michigan. He's taught at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and he's currently the chair of the Anthro Department at uh, University of Southern California. He is a member of our SeaCard uh, External Advisory Board, and he spent uh, the last 20 years off and on in, in Bali, and he's returning to Bali next Wednesday. Okay. Um, some of the high points of his career is he was a research assistant for Clifford Geertz at the Institute of Advanced Study, and some of you may know uh, Geertz's work on the Balinese cockfight, which deals a lot with the symbolism, some of the things that are analogous to what uh, Dr. Lansing's dealt with in this uh, video that we saw. He was a Fulbright Senior Regional uh, Research Fellowship for Southeast Asia, and he received the Phi Kappa Phi Award for the Three Worlds of Bali. Uh, publications range from the seminal publication, uh, Economic Growth and the Traditional Society, a, a cautionary tale from Bali, this was in Human Organization, to the extensive work in his book, The Three Worlds of Bali. He's done three ethnographic films, uh, Three Worlds of Bali, Chiefs and Kings of Indonesia, and The Goddess and the Computer, which we've just seen. Plus, last but not least, uh, the Bali Notebook, which is uh, development software, which he's using right now for uh, development in Bali. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Stephen Lansing. Thank you very much, and uh, I feel very much that I'm among friends here. So uh, what I propose to do is talk briefly about uh, some of the issues in, in this project, which I hope will be of interest to some of you and, and will continue our collaborative exchanges. Uh, the problem with this film, of course, is that it becomes a film about computers and it's very much about Bali. What I want to do is try to put it in a different context. What, the, what, what we were really up to is looking at the effects of the Green Revolution, which is sort of a broader uh, question. So let me say just a few words about that and then I'd like to show you some slides and talk about what we were actually doing with that computer. I'm not sure that that's clear to the film and, uh, and where I think it's headed and what I think might be of interest to uh, fellow workers in these fields. So uh, the Green Revolution happened in Bali very quickly. It happened in the space of about five years the Balinese adopted high yielding varieties of rice over most of South Bali and that meant uh, a tremendous change in, in, in many areas. Uh, George Condominas wrote some years ago that agriculture always has both a social and a technical aspect or component and I think we haven't paid very much attention to the social aspects of things like the Green Revolution. In the Balinese case, uh, very briefly what happened was that the government of Indonesia set up a system of uh, banking called the Bank Rakyat, a, a, a people's bank to furnish farmers with credit so that they could purchase agrochemicals and seed stocks. And they also set up a marketing system so that farmers could sell their rice, the high yielding varieties of rice, uh, back to the government. So, that, and finally farmers were encouraged, uh, very strongly encouraged, to plant high yielding varieties of rice as quickly as possible. Now this is all was laudable and understandable at the time because Indonesia was facing famine. And in a sense the Green Revolution was a, was a tremendous success in all over Indonesia. It was able to push rice production up above the rate of population growth as happened elsewhere in the world. Uh, but unfortunately the rate of increase of agrochemicals is the fastest curve of all. So what happened in Bali is that within a space, within an eye blink of time, a system of collective management of irrigation and rice terrace ecology was replaced by a system of essentially capitalist agriculture, by which I mean each farmer was, in, was uh, required or encouraged <laughs> to uh, plant rice as fast as possible, to purchase labor and seed stocks and agrochemicals to grow this rice, and then to sell it on the market. So as one farmer said to me in uh, 78, you know, I'm not planting rice anymore, I'm planting motorcycles because he's planting rice to sell, to buy motorcycles. So it meant that very quickly a system of, of, of collective management, which you've just seen briefly outlined in that film, 
was replaced by a kind of a free-for-all, or what we would call a, a capitalist system in which people competed for access to those materials, and of course also for water. Uh, as I was studying uh, the traditional system of agriculture, I found uh, after about a year that I was working in parallel with Balinese who were also trying to understand what had happened. There were reports from different regions of Bali of chaos in water distribution and explosions of pests. All sorts of things were going wrong very quickly and people had a hard time understanding what had happened. Balinese farmers were not against the Green Revolution. It was, first of all, portrayed as a patriotic duty. People needed food. And it was very productive. If you could sell, if you, if you, went in, if you sort of bought the package, as you had to do, then you, were, you could make a lot more... Uh, you could turn rice into something that was a source of cash. So uh, the reasons for its adoption were not so much, they were not government coercion, it was the attractiveness of the package. But it's now, you know, it's, it's a generation after the beginning of the Green Revolution. It's two decades after its onset in Bali, and we cope with a different set of circumstances now. That is, that it's clear that what happened was that a traditional system of collective management was, was simply set aside briefly, and... In a way, it set in motion a kind of an experiment. I mean, what, we, what I saw when I happened to start studying this problem was the effects of this, this sh sudden shift when the uh, collective system was no longer allowed to, to function. So uh, I think it is a common problem because the Green Revolutions happened in lots of places. And what, what the computer modeling was really about was exploring one question, which is, what is the effect of the collective management system on the management of rice terrace ecology? Okay. We know that rice terraces are artificial ecosystems in the sense that they are human-managed uh, systems and basically it's through the control of water that people control the growth of, uh, of, of rice. The question was, what about the, the uh, effect of these large-scale systems of management which are implemented by the temple system? How much effect do they have on the management of the terrace ecology? Is there, in other words, is there another, at a, at a different scale than the management of an indiv individual farmer, is there a, are there real biological effects to systems of collective management? So the computer modeling project was concerned with trying to evaluate that question. And I hooked up with Jim Kramer, who's a mathematical systems ecologist and a biological oceanographer, had no business really working in Bali, except that rice paddies, in a sense, are, are uh, aquatic ecosystems. So we framed it in that way and tried to understand uh, what were the effects of human management on uh, terrace ecology. So maybe if I could put the slides back down again. Let me go through just a few slides, with the lights, rather. Uh, you've just endured an hour of film, so I'm going to make this brief, but I, I'd like to, to explain what the underlying logic of this approach well, was to look at the relationship, the trade-off really, between uh, irrigation and pest control. <coughs> Actually, we've also got this in the software, but uh, you've seen in the film, and here's, here's the structure of the system, which is these little gray stipple lines are the boundaries of catchment areas, the dark lines are the rivers, the little boxes are subox or irrigation areas, average size about 50 to 100 hectares, and these little Christmas trees are, are water temples. So our model was, first of all, a physical model. How does the system work? We settled for a very straightforward uh, uh, mechanistic model of rainfall runoff relations from one region to the next. Uh, secondly, we modeled various kinds of rice growth. We did that mechanistically, just in terms as long as, according to our model, as long as the rice has enough water, it will grow. And finally, pests. Now, the interesting point about the ecological modeling is that there is a, a trade-off between the two constraints of water sharing and pest control. Water sharing constraint says everybody plants rice at different times, stagger the planting so as to divide up the water as much as possible. But that is in opposition to the pest constraint, which says uh, the way the Balinese traditionally control pests is by having a fallow period. So the rice grows and the pest will grow as long as the rice is there for them to eat, but when you have a fallow period, the pest population will die. How effective that is depends upon the dispersal rate. In other words, <laughs> the pest can move from field to field, and it's only by having, uh, like this, so it's only by having a, a fallow period over a sufficiently large area that the fallowing will work to control pests. So those are opposing constraints, and what we're looking at in this model is <clears throat> what are the effects of different hierarchies or structures of cropping pattern on optimizing rice by optimizing those two conditions. So the model kind of works like that. You've already seen it. Um, basically, we do a, a, an annual model given certain assumptions, what are the effects, and uh, <clears throat> what we're aiming for is a picture of what are, the, what are the effects of this total system of coordination 
on rice production over these two rivers. So the model looks at several different alternatives from everybody follows one cropping pattern over the whole system to each of those little subox of which there are 172 follows its own. So we specify a range of different possibilities to say, you know, what's the optimum cropping pattern to, to optimize rice production by those two constraints? And uh, it makes it possible to hold everything else constant, that is, hold the biology constant, hold the, hold the uh, physical system constant, and evaluate only the effects of different kinds of levels of collective management. So, let's see. These you've seen, let me just quickly get to the results. Uh, we're going to look at the software presently, those who are interested. So anybody who's really interested in the details of how it works, we'll, we'll get onto that eventually. Uh, these are just histograms, so it makes it possible to compare the effects. In other words, if Tingulat Maung changes its cropping pattern, what will be the effects on their downstream neighbors in changing on? The effects are going to be different depending on the specific local conditions. Okay, I apologize for this slide, but here we see pest loss according to how the, the scale of social coordination. In this case, each of the subox, each little unit, sets its own cropping pattern, and the effect is massive losses to pests. If the temple set the cropping patterns, then it's much reduced loss to pests. So that's one constraint. Um, water stress works the opposite way. That is, if the whole watershed has a single cropping pattern, then a lot of people are going to run out of water because they're not dividing enough to share it. But here you see that if the temple set the cropping patterns, they do pretty well in terms of water stress. So overall, balancing yield, um, balancing those constraints, the effect is that the temples optimize rice production. In other words, they have the highest yield by uh, setting the optimum balance between water sharing and pest control. Okay. Finally, what we're up to now, uh, the students, the Balinese have gotten interested in this as a tool. And the reason for their interest, it isn't well explained in the film, I think, is that the Green Revolution has scrambled uh, cropping patterns and uh, pests in ways that make it difficult for the traditional system of management to cope. There are new varieties of rice being planted all the time, there are new kinds of pests, and it's hard to calculate the effects of, of these changes. It's a very tightly coupled system. We know enough about the hydrology, you know, it's very tightly coupled. And so it's, it's, a, it's a tough project to evaluate the effects of a change of cropping pattern on a, you know, let's say on three weirs. So this is Tuti, who's a, a a Balinese student in the agronomy department. She and three of her colleagues have spent last year gathering the detailed ecological and social data on five rivers that will be necessary to get a really precise uh, result from our modeling. So here she is talking to one of the priests at the Master Water Temple about the results. The hope is that if she's successful, we'll be able to, first of all, to to model the effects of changes in cropping patterns, and secondly, that she may be able to uh, use this as a way to get on top of the, uh, the changes that have been set in motion by the Green Revolution. So the new data gathering system called the Subak Information System is just a way of gathering data about different regions of Bali, gathering the kinds of data that would be needed for a more uh, effective uh, model. And it sort of looks like this. Basically, you just create an icon, like one of this. This is a rainfall station. And you can, when, when, what she does is to interview farmers and to try to get comparable data from each area so that in the end, this can be used as the basis for a, a new modeling project. One of the interesting results of that has been uh, the hydrology department and the engineers have realized that a lot of their data isn't very good. The promise that we'll be able to give them tools that will enable them to do the modeling better has catalyzed a new, a new interest among the uh, public works people in getting accurate data, getting good hydrology. So this is the hydrology department working with my students, uh, going back and measuring again these flow rates so that uh, we can begin to get that right. So here are these students then. At the same time, they're also working with the water temple people uh, in uh, gathering the data and uh, So here they are with the priest of one of the Maschetti temples. Okay, uh, that's the last slide. This is just a 
a bicycle turning into a lotus flower. Can I have the slides up? Or rather, the lights up, please. Okay, half an hour. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, how do you how do you keep from um, uh, how do you combat the centralization of the, of the control of computers? Uh, how do you make sure that the farmers are given the opportunity to actually use these for their own benefit? Well, it's a little more complicated than we portrayed in the film. What we're trying to do now is the, the students have taken over this project and. In the end, what will happen is there will be a computer that will, that will be a source of data and modeling for everybody. Okay? Probably only one computer will be needed. And if you, if you turn it on and start to look at what it says, you'll be looking at uh, water temples, you'll be looking at ecology, you'll be looking at hydrology, and you'll be shown some of the interconnections among them. So if anybody uses it, he's going to see this system of indigenous knowledge. That's, that's what's in the computer. Uh, and that, I think, is good in itself. The, 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 there is, however, a next question, which is, can it actually be used for predicting results that are of practical importance for farmers? And we don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, I, it is, there's certainly a felt need among the farmers. If you get a group of people who are trying to set a cropping pattern for three weirs, and a small change can mean you know, that people can not have enough water to fulfill that cropping pattern, it's very important to them. So it's worth, it's worth doing this modeling because of the the, the possibility, if, if it's accurate, it'll be very useful and the farmers will use it. There's no doubt of that. I mean, they're, they're, uh, I'm working for them now. <laughs> uh, we, we sort of shifted from the scientific goals to trying to fulfill the promise to the Balinese to turn this into something they can use. Yeah. Well, as far as I was concerned, I wasn't really introducing computers. I was just modeling the effects of social control of these ecologies. It happened to be in a computer, but really what I was trying to show is the effects of this difference between... What I was trying to show is that uh, there is a social system that controls production and has important effects. And you need a computer to do that because of the complexity of the, of the ecology. I mean, in other words, I already knew in 1983 that the water temples thought that they controlled uh, rice terrace ecology. But what I didn't know was how much of that control had meaningful ecological effect. And neither did they, you see. I mean, the water temple system evolved over centuries during a time when, uh, <laughs> as you know, when production of rice was based on, on energy from the sun. As soon as you start using agrochemicals, and changing cropping patterns and using high-yielding high varieties, then the old signs don't work anymore, you see? It's a very different ecology. A, a, an ecology based on agrochemicals is very different than the ecology that they had you know, before 1970. And so they were at a loss, just as I was, to know what the effects would be. It could have been, it, for example, Gertz could have been right, it could have been purely a ritualized system. It could have been a ritual clockwork. The best argument I had against the temples from an engineer was that this is a ritual clockwork and it's outmoded. Once you shift from old native varieties to high yielding varieties and agrochemicals, then the ritual clock goes out of phase. That's the question we were really trying to test. We were saying, is, is the temple a ritual clockwork or is it a system for social management that, it, that is that's site specific and flexible? Uh, yes, Roger. Well, we were, that was a, thing we cooked up, what you've just seen is uh, something, basically it's a simulation model deriving from systems ecology with a front end, as it's called, in Hypercard. We've just switched, though, to a, to a GIS system called MIPS, a geographic information system, because that program had to be tailor-made by a biologist for a particular river. It was a program in BASIC. If you want to generalize this to other places, you can't have ecologists and anthropologists writing new programs in BASIC for every river. So we hope now to be able to do the same sorts of things using IBMs with, you know, garden variety software. So BASIC is HyperCard, not the Microsoft Well, only what the pictures are HyperCard, but the guts of it, I mean, the model itself is a program in BASIC. It's just that, it, you know, when that, the program's finished its calculation, then it comes out and what you see are uh, graphs and pictures. 
But not to say that that's not important, but, but people can get the illusion that it's uh, more than it is. <laughs> it's just an illustration. Yes? Uh, we don't know how accurate it is because our first model was based on a year of historical data and we got nothing else to compare it with. But now the students are going back and getting another year of data, or in some cases two years of data. And by a year of data, I mean they're actually going to every village, every subak, every dam and every rainfall station and getting the cropping pattern and what kinds of pests were there and how fast they moved and whether, and whether insecticides, a, a tremendous amount of site-specific data. Once we have all that and we've modeled it, then we can test, you know, we can test one year, we can test the model's predictions against uh, a, a different year of historical data. And so, in other words, by August we maybe begin to know how accurately it predicts uh, uh, these things that it predicts. Yes? Ultimately, what the computer model is Oh yeah, because because all what the model really shows is the importance of these collective systems of management. In other words, our water comes from the territory of some other village upstream and the, the, it's only because we cooperate with them and we get one third of the share and they get two thirds that we can make this function, this system function. I think it's, in other words, there, there are things that are specific to Balinese hydrology that would be different elsewhere. If the Balinese lived in China and had a, a great big river and were sort of tapping out of a large river and there was plenty of water for everybody, you have very different constraints, right? And you wouldn't have this hydrological connectivity problem. So. Uh, I, what I'm saying is I think the hydrology of Bali, the, the, the topography of Bali makes social coordination essential. And the, what all the temple, all that the model shows is that that's true. You know, it shows the effects of, of uh, you, you can simulate the effects of not having that kind of coordination. And the effects are you run out of water and the pests go crazy, which is what happened in the 70s. Are the public officials trying to use the model sometime in the future to control the system? Apart from the social structure that existed. Well, in a sense, they. It sounded like that's what the government officials wanted. So the tax officers wanted to have a computer. The hydrologists wanted to have one. Are they just going to sit back and use it descriptively, or are they going to use it for control purposes? Well, what we found, they say, okay, a system of control, but then you turn it on and they begin to see, as soon as they actually start to use it, what it shows you is the importance of the collective management system. In other words, you can't really operate it without seeing that, I think. That, so that's why I, I think it's the more they use it, the more they'll be reluctant to, uh, uh, to do anything that could, that, could, that could take apart that system of collective management. I mean, what, what, what we've just seen is that collective management does best in terms of management. And the model is, an understanding of the model is not a substitute for the uh, social management. Right, it, it just shows you the effects of the system of social management. It can't replace that system of social management. It, at least, well, I hope that's right. <laughs> yes? The foundational problem is the imposition of green revolution Western technology that do this 1,000 year system out of balance. Why not address those issues instead of introducing more Western technology? Because if we the Green Revolution has happened in the last generation, and if, if it hadn't, many people would have starved, probably, and now we, th that's not an option anymore. I mean, the Balinese population, the world population has doubled since the Green Revolution. When Norman Borlaug got the, the Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution in 1962, he said, well, I'm, what we're doing is buying a breathing space in which to find an honorable equation between population growth and food supply. It's now a generation later. The Green Revolution has happened, to, to, to go back from it would mean, would mean, I mean, we've got new problems now. The problems now are coping with the effect, coping in effect with the success of the Green Revolution, I think. The Green Revolution has raised productivity, but it can't go on, it, it's, it's not going to permit another doubling of either food production or population, I think. So now we're kind of forced 
the problem now really is sustainable agriculture. I think. Yes. So as an extension of this question, if this aquatic environment that supported frogs and all kinds of things that they ate was disrupted by agrochemicals, then are they still using the agrochemicals and is this still a problem? It's much better now. Uh, the, the government has decided to, they're no longer subsidizing pesticides. The fallowing period has now been adopted. It's, the, the government has recognized that that's a good idea. And it's now permissible to plant native Balinese varieties of rice. And you also, it's as I was saying earlier, they're, they're worth much more in the market. People are still using fertilizers, but the Balinese farmers themselves are kind of experimenting with how much fertilizer you need to make the system go. So the good thing that's happened is that this massive application of organochloride pesticides has stopped. And that was terrible. I mean, in the 70s, there was a World Bank study of this of use of pesticides that said that the island had been pervasively polluted with uh, pesticides by the late 70s. But that's, you know, they de they, in the end, they degrade. And uh, so that, that problem's been, we're on top of that problem. We, I mean, Balinese are on top of that problem, I think, now. Yeah. Uh, what kind of traditional government No, I've just fi written, finished a book. It'll be out in next month saying that, that that's not true. And why, the reason it's not true is that because of the Jiroga Day, the system of, t of management by this, this, this building up of power in the water temple system was apart from kingship. And that's clear going back. That's a long story, but it's clear, it's clear going back as far as we know. So the Dutch, for example, believed that when they conquered Bali, that they were going to restore an ancient system of royal control that had been you know, it had fallen apart, they were going to restore it. But uh, in fact, the system of royal control never existed. The Dutch created a kind of a fairy tale model of kings and uh, uh, irrigation management, but, which had never existed before. In other words, they tried to recreate a feudal monarchy in Bali and pretend that that was indigenous. It was not indigenous, and it can be shown. Uh, yes? Yeah. How, how do you visualize the system working once that's kind of Well, it had, and it was, it was, this system of temple, of collective management was so threatened that it could have collapsed. And I think the reason it didn't collapse is because people discovered that they had to cooperate in order to, for hydrological reasons. If everybody planted their own rice at whatever time, for a little while you could get, you could grow a lot of rice, but then you discover you didn't get enough water, the, 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 the the allocation of water became unpredictable, and so people were forced to go back to a system of cooperation. Uh, and that's meant then that the, the threat, the Green Revolution could have disempowered the temple system, and it did briefly, but they had to go back and, and reconstitute it in order to manage the rice terraces, I think. Uh, right. No, what, well, they've, what they've had, yes, they've had to synchronize planning, so each subak will have, to, will have to collectively choose, but they do it in a democratic way, what the cropping pattern will be. And everybody plants the same variety, same, same sequence, you know, rice, a second variety of rice, vegetables, whatever it may be, in order to get the fallowing effect. Uh, but it's, now it's possible, you see, they can plant green revolution rice, or they can plant old Balinese rice, they can plant anything they want. It's, it isn't a ritual clockwork, it's just a system for management. And so what in fact happens is they, they do alternate, depending partly on the price and uh, whether they think it's going to be a wet year or a dry year. Yes? Yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, you approach how many decision makers in Jakarta or Bogor? Because in the two cities, 
we've decided which variety of rice we are going to plant. Hmm. So by introducing this kind of model, do you have some idea of the well, I took it to the director, the director of irrigation in Jakarta, and they were interested in it, but we haven't sort of been back to see. I think if, if we can show, what I want to do now is, is, is turn this whole modeling thing over to the students in Bali, and by the end of the summer we will have done that. And then I think it's up to them. These are students from Udayana University and the dean of the agronomy in Udayana. If they want to, to try it elsewhere, then it becomes some, you know, that becomes their decision, <laughs> I think. Uh, yes? Okay. <laughs> well, no, it's just I have a lot of promises to fulfill. I mean, the, the hydrology department says we need, you know, we, we need to do the hyd... Okay, I can quickly answer this, and maybe this is the last question. For the hydrology department to do its job, it wants to know about the flow from top to bottom in these rivers. Okay, the flow is going to depend on the cropping pattern, because the, the rivers are always being used for irrigation. So for them to do a good hydrological modeling job, they need to know cropping patterns. And that's what my students are doing. It means that people need to put the data. I mean, data has been gathered in lots of places, including Bali, for a long time. But What's happened now is it's possible to put that data together and to use it to say, okay, we can actually do the hydrology because we, we're going to know what the cropping pattern and irrigation demands are for a whole section of rivers. And then on that basis, it be becomes possible to you know, give useful advice or perhaps think about new irrigation systems. I mean, the, the Department of Public Works are, are they're good hearted people and they want to build irrigation systems that are helpful. So it may be possible, this is a tool that they can use, I think. Yes. Well, yeah, I don't, in the end, I don't know how far, I don't want to pretend that it's going to work at Batur Temple. It depends on whether it's some of the, some of the young priests are interested, and it may be that, that they may fit into the system. I, I don't really know. I, 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 it's an open question to me. Oh, Jan, and then perhaps we should. Great, thank you. I guess I should say if anybody's interested in the modeling, the Mac user group has got.